Good evening, friends. Good evening, friends. Good evening, friends. It is hard to hear when you're talking. Yes, I found that to be true. Thanks for uh, your attention. So, our special guests are all seated, and if you don't have a seat, there are some seats up front. So anybody who would like to move, this is a good time to do it. Come on forward, room in the front row, room over here, room over here. Anybody who would like to, come on up. Good, good, good. Fill them up, we're full so that it's a lot easier for people who come late to sneak in the back than it is. That's good. We are so glad to have you here for the Stephen G. Memor Stephen G. Carey Memorial Lecture of 2018. It's wonderful to see a full house at Pendle Hill, isn't it? Yes. You're the most popular speaker we have had this year. And you have lots of friends in the audience. Yes, indeed. The registration, I get an email every time somebody registers, and it's been flowing in all day long, all weekend long, so we're so delighted that all of you are here. It's just great to see a full house for this fabulous event. I better look at my notes because <laughs> I'm supposed to keep things brief, and there they have. They've disappeared already. Okay. So first of all, I'd like to invite you to take uh, your cell phones and silence them or your beepers or whatever else makes a loud sound. I'm going to check mine just in case. And then I'm going to remind you that we have guests who are joining us by live streaming. In case you miss any of Sarah's remarks, you'll be able to see this again on YouTube once we load the video. And I will remind our guests who are viewing us by live stream, if there is any difficulty that you encounter with the live stream link that we, that we sent to you, we are also streaming this live on Facebook. So move from the Ustream link that we gave you and go directly to Facebook. Our Facebook page will have it uh, there. And if you miss it, you'll be able to see it on our YouTube channel, Pendle Hill USA. I would like to invite you to take, uh, if you did not already get one, uh, a calendar from Ricardo Levens Morales, who's a good friend of Pendle Hill, he decided that after he had sold as many calendars as he felt he could, he had an overstock and said, please give them to your guests at Pendle Hill. Beautiful, beautiful calendars and his work for progressive causes for so many years is, uh, is a wonderful thing to hang on your wall as a reminder that we're all in this together. So that brings me to Stephen G. Carey. Um, for those of you who don't know, I'm Stephen Carey, and I had a book with me as well, which I must have laid aside. And that's a bad thing, because I was going to hold it up. Uh, Stephen G. Carey is, but was both a very active uh, Quaker in the world of activism as well as in academia. He served in the administration of Haverford College, of which he was a graduate, undergraduate, and worked in international relations uh, with a degree from Columbia. He's probably best known to many of us as a, a, a conscientious objector during World War II, after which, in 1946 through 48, uh, was the director of AFSC's European Relief Mission, for which AFSC and the British uh, equivalent received on behalf of friends everywhere the Nobel Peace Prize in 1947. Um, he also was uh, in the administration of Haverford and its part-time president for a long time, worked tirelessly for peace and is well known for being the chair of the committee of AFSC uh, that uh, I'm having a blank moment. 
um, sorry. Um, speak Truth to Power um, was issued while he was clerk of that committee. Uh, it's been reissued, with giving credit to Bayard Rustin as uh, one of its principal authors. So both as a Quaker in the world of relief and peacemaking, um, and as an academic, we like our uh, carry memorial lectures to be Quakers in their public life, and all of our speakers have been. Um, this evening, I give you um, Jen Karsten to introduce our speaker. Hi. I get to serve Pendle Hill as executive director. It's one of the greatest joys of my life. And John, if you did that without notes, I'm really impressed. Well, <laughs> the book is called The Intrepid Quaker. Um, it is a delight to see so many familiar faces in this room tonight. Are, is there anybody for whom this is your first visit to Pendle Hill? Welcome. <laughs> Very good. What about um, f uh, people who've taught here, workshop leaders, courses? Um, mm -hmm. What about people who've been students, workshop attendees, pamphlet authors? Mm. Uh, yeah, just keep it up. <laughs> there we are. Um, volunteers, sojourners, former or current board members. Oh, welcome, welcome, welcome. Sarah could have had her hand up during many of those um, invitations. Uh, hi. It's really a joy to welcome Sarah Willie LeBreton as our Cary lecturer for 2018. She's a member of Providence Monthly Meeting, and she teaches at Swarthmore College. She chairs the Department of Sociology and Anthropology there. And beginning this summer, she will begin as provost, which is like a vice president for academic affairs overseeing the curricular program of the school. Her career at Swarthmore has spanned 21 years. And during that time, because of her gifts, she's been called on for a variety of roles, not just to be a professor. And when I talk about her gifts, I don't necessarily mean her academic excellence. I'm referring to her ability, when times are challenging, to bring people together into dialogue that has the kind of spaciousness to it that lets new truths emerge. And she's... Um, She's got special skills in that. Um, for these reasons, she, in recent years, was asked to chair the task force on diversity and chair the task force on sexual misconduct. She's sought for these roles because when things are really difficult and people are in pain and it's easy for me and others to feel wound up, it's not Sarah's default to be wound up. She has an ability to wind down and bring you into that steadiness with her. And she lets us enter that place where multiple perspectives and experiences can meet and we can create new visions collectively. I think she told me once that she came into this work in her home environment of origin. She and her siblings um, were swimming in the waters of the time, waters rough with challenges um, to the systems of race, to the systems of gender and sexual orientation. And in her family, um, in particular, challenges to systems of religion. And her parents offered the family models of resolving conflict, constructive engagement, perseverance, and they modeled the deep importance of community. They made it clear to their children that they were part of something larger and more mysterious and intriguing than even themselves. As an undergraduate at Haverford, she experienced the struggles of being one of a small number of black students. She wrote her thesis on the experiences of black students at Haverford compared to what was known about the experiences of black students in other colleges. Following Haverford, she attended Northwestern University to continue pursuing questions raised in the field of sociology, such as social inequality and complementarity, researching the 
the comparative experiences of black students at historically black and predominantly white colleges and universities. Outside of the academy, Sarah brings this same curious, open, highly attuned mind as an active community member, often lending her gifts to Quaker organizations. She serves on Haverford College's corporation and board of managers. She regularly advises groups and committees for Philadelphia yearly meeting, provides consultation around the country, and very fortunately for us, she's taught at Pendle Hill for over a decade, served on our board, clerked our education committee, given me countless hours of advice, and been an advisor to many of our programs. Her most recent publication, Transforming the Academy, is an edited volume on faculty who, in some way or another, represent difference, and how they navigate that difference in their classroom, amongst themselves as colleagues as well. When I think of you, Sarah, an Angela Davis quote comes to my mind, bridges are walls turned sideways. Friends, it's our custom to settle into a worshipful silence from which Sarah can speak when she's ready. Will you join me now in welcoming her voice in this quiet way? After I had bid my mom and dad and brothers goodbye in the parking lot, fighting back tears, but before I ever set foot in a class at Haverford College, I was given the opportunity to join a faculty member in their home for dinner. Several of us signed up and I drew the straw of not just a faculty member, but an alum of the college, as well as a former vice president and a former interim president and his spouse. I found my way from Gummery Dormitory to the on-campus home of Steve and Betty Carey, where I met several other first-year students over lemonade before dinner. Mrs. Carey welcomed us to the dinner table with the invitation. Steve, would thee join me at the table and bring thy new friends? I did not know that this was plain speech, but thought Mrs. Carey might have been a member of the theater. <clears throat> and was having a bit of fun with all of us. As the evening continued and her speech did not alter, I recognized that something was at work that was new to me. I don't remember what was served, or the topic of our conversation, I do remember feeling welcomed and acknowledged. And I saw how this couple appeared to be genuinely interested in me and each student around the table. What a marvelous beginning to what was to be for me an alternately difficult, mesmerizing, unhappy, extraordinary, occasionally boring, sometimes painful, enlightening, challenging, and ultimately deeply satisfying college experience. In my comments this evening, I hope you will find some parallels to my Haverford experience. Of course, my intent is not that you should find listening difficult, unhappy, <laughs> boring, or painful, but perhaps in my comments and our exchange following it, there will be something enlightening challenging, and even satisfying. 
you have come out of your warm apartments and houses tonight with expectation. And I meet you here with gratitude. I am also grateful to Pendle Hill for the invitation and particularly to Norville Reese, my colleague on the Haverford Board of Managers, for the generosity to have brought the publication of the intrepid Quaker Memoirs, Speeches, and Writings of Stephen G. Carey to fruition, and to Norville and Anne for helping to make this evening possible, to Dorothy Carey for her continued engagement, my dear friends and mentors on the staff and the board at Pendle Hill, particularly the Committee on Education, and to all of the people who make up this, my local community. From my chosen family, Jonathan and Jeremy LeBreton, who are here this evening, and my chosen faith communities, the members and attenders of Providence Monthly Meeting, and the friends of African descent at the Ujima Peace Center, and all those co-workers, students, and friends with an upper and lower case F, from Swarthmore and Haverford and Bryn Mawr, known and unknown to me, who call me by their presence and energy to live into my better nature, even when I am not always able to answer their call. I assume that genuine social relationship is necessary for justice. And I believe that its absence leads to what most of us think of as evil. As much as we hunger for mutuality and connection, for many of us, the daily temptation of our lives is to distinguish ourselves as worthy, aware, insightful. In other words, desiring mutuality and connection, we are mistaken that such connection will come when those around us think we're great. And great can mean any number of things. Rich, smart, fashionable, well-read, well-intended, well-spoken, funny, handsome, pretty. If we become distracted by the pursuit of seeming great, as opposed to being in loving connection with each other, we are disconnected from genuine community. And when we are disconnected from being truly present for and with each other, that rupture allows us with greater ease to think of and treat those whom we dislike, or sometimes only those with whom we disagree, as unworthy, unaware, even evil. I have a flattering mirror in the bathroom of my home. I look in it and I don't have to face the fact that I really must lose weight. The mirror shows me that I'm aging and I'm okay with that because it's out of my control. But eating less, eating more healthfully and exercising, those are things over which I have more control. For me, it takes a great deal of work to eat healthfully, to exercise regularly, and to prioritize a healthful physical routine. So having a mirror that reflects a fantasy version of myself lets me off the hook <laughs> from needing to do anything about this now. I have experienced firsthand that the temptation to see ourselves as we wish to be seen is powerful. I believe that understanding its role in our lives can help us understand what drives us, see ourselves with more candor and humility, seek out our biggest fears, lead us away from gossip and resentment about others, and open up experiences of continuing revelation. In her recent blog post, A Whole Heart, Marcel Martin writes, quote, visible realities spring from invisible depths and genuine transformation comes only by healing root causes. Becoming aware of the deepest causes requires opening our inner senses and paying attention to things that cause discomfort. We may have been born with open hearts, exquisitely sensitive to spiritual, energetic, and interpersonal realities, but most of us quickly learned to shut off certain kinds of perception and to erect protective barriers over our hearts. Whether it is discovering the root causes of compulsive overeating or workaholism, the unhealthy satisfaction of speaking truth to power in ways that humiliate and degrade our enemies, or hiding from experiences that we know will pull us to our growing edge, 
opening our hearts and minds to alternatives, to root causes, as Martin says, can be transformative. But I digress. Let me speak for a moment of how I am using the word justice. The late 20th century political philosopher Iris Marion Young spent most of her career wrestling with the idea of justice. She reminds her readers that the concept of justice like fairness, ethics, righteousness, have their versions in each society. But that the current notion in vogue in Western industrialized, putatively democratic ones have narrowed that understanding to center on distribution only, distribution of wealth, income, and other material goods. She encourages us to think bigger than those important things and to consider issues of decision making, division of labor, and culture. For young, justice is about an ethics of communication and acknowledgement. In addition to the fair distribution of goods, living in a just environment includes learning and using satisfying and expansive skills in settings where people can see and appreciate us, participating in the formation, maintenance, running of, and sometimes changes to institutions and organizations, and receiving recognition for such participation. Justice for young includes playing and communicating with others, and expressing our experiences, feelings, and perspectives in contexts where others can listen. And all of this in an atmosphere free from domination, coercion, and violence. In short, for young, justice encompasses participating in decision making about our own lives and the common life of our group. It includes the responsibility to respect others and to assume that one is also respected, and it entails freedom from oppression. This is not an easy place to get to. In many of our societies, we have invested bureaucratic decision-making with a great deal of honor. Those of us who work in bureaucracies or are professionals are socialized into respecting and honoring that form of decision-making. When we must move outside of it, we are often in a paradoxical situation of not quite knowing how to do the deep listening and the careful participation that is required of mutual respect and shared decision-making. Both the shared governance of decision-making among faculty and Quaker process have given me some much-needed practice in this domain. When we are truly in community, we are seen and known and appreciated. Madeleine Lengel, the extraordinary 20th century writer, keen social observer, theologian, and humanitarian, is perhaps most famous for her book, now a movie, A Wrinkle in Time. Four other books follow as part of that series, offering further glimpses into the possibilities that she imagines of existence. I'd like to focus on the second in the series, A Wind at the Door. In it, Lengel's characters discover that when we are named, which is the same as being seen, known, and acknowledged, our neurotic needs either to hide in the shadows, disconnected from our fellows, or to seek the spotlight compulsively are reduced. We can be at peace with being part of everything in the universe that is named and nameable. Again, Marcel Martin. One dark night, as I walked home, she writes, I told myself there was no possible relation between me and the stars that were light years away. I felt alone in an impersonal universe, the random result of chemistry, biology, and physics. I gave up hope of attaining greater understanding through my own efforts, when suddenly, an inner eye opened. I saw that the stars and I are intimately connected in a larger oneness. I experienced a divine light flowing through all things, including me and those faraway lights. They were in me. I was in them. I felt this light flowing up my legs and through my heart and arms and out my fingertips into the world. I became aware of an invisible power great enough to heal any problem on earth. I discovered my true existence in this vast radiant wholeness." Unquote. 
Like Lengel and hundreds of wise people over time, this sense of connection to all that is good is found in our ability to love others. <clears throat> Regardless of what we name it, it offers us strength to pursue the most difficult things. In the Wrinkle in Time Quintet, Lengel conceives of evil as not naming, not loving, not forgiving, not acknowledging, a lack of mutual accountability, a wild dance toward nothingness. Evil is represented as a multiple thing for which she uses the word ekthroi, the plural form of the Greek word for enemy. In A Wind at the Door, Lengel offers her readers a fictional interpretation of what the mid 20th century Austrian Jewish theologian Martin Buber argues was the experience of God, acknowledgement and relationship. In his famous manuscript, I and Thou, Buber argues that there are two relationships that the individual has. I, it, describes the world of sensations and experience, and I, thou, describes the world of social relations. Published in 1923, we can appreciate the searing nature of his insights to the allegedly sophisticated and civilized societies that were emerging from World War I, in which the scale of war was broader and more encompassing than it had ever been. Even though this war was more encompassing, it was not more devastating. We must always acknowledge, for those whose lives are cut short, whose families, towns, cities, and peoples are traumatized, whose human signposts have been eviscerated, each war is devastating. For those whose lives are disrupted and circumscribed by decisions made by others, each project of removing people from their homes or of contributing to the conditions that drive people from their homes is devastating. That is just one of the reasons that I do not see the end of human life on planet Earth as the catastrophic event. Many peoples have suffered catastrophic events and we must learn from those that remain behind. From their wisdom, our understanding can grow in learning how to navigate a world painfully new and harsh. From their wisdom, we learn how to walk with each other toward more mutual responsibility of each other and the planet. From their wisdom, the survivors, how to channel our anger in ways constructive and generative. Indeed, from their wisdom, how to survive the human storms we cannot control with the grace and compassion we can. But I digress. World War I was fundamentally a European war, though Europe drafted its colonies to fight on its behalf. I want to be clear that I'm aware that war has been a regular and painful part of human history taken up by many groups. I and Thou was published again in English in 1937 on the eve of World War II. I am sure that more contemporary scholars have noted that Buber's characterization of humans' individual engagement with others uh, as utilitarian and sensation or engaged with others in deep social connection, describes human alienation from other humans, alienation from other animals, from the planet, the universe, the ancestors, and the stars. He describes something quite different from the relationships that many indigenous people or folk and traditional communities have to other humans, living and dead, and to other things more generally, carbon-based and not, solid and ethereal. Buber's insight is prophetic precisely for the civilizations of Earth that privilege relationships to things that have become alienated from other people, their histories, their relationship to the planet. His message is particularly prophetic 
for those attempting to form meaning and meaningfulness in relation to status, sensation, and the compulsive accumulation of things. For Buber, it is our relationships that ultimately bring us into relationship with the eternal you. And for him, the eternal you is synonymous with God. For Buber, for Lengel, for Marcel Martin, Doug Gwynn, Steve Carey, and for many wise people among us, God is not a bigger, badder, domineering version of ourselves, but the very energy and power of relationship each of us have to each other. For many, God is the knowing of each other without the boundaries of what you can do for me or what I can make you do. For Buber, as for Lengel, evil, then, is the absence of genuine relationship. Many people have thought about what we call the absence of that relationship. To personify evil presents me with a dilemma, since to name it as I would name a person invites me to slip into naming people evil rather than their behavior. But like interpretations of God that personify God, evil too is often personified, and we are familiar with its many names. I understand Lengel and Buber as less interested in naming the absence of relationship than seeking to repair its rupture in the universe, seeking to reestablish relationship in order to reestablish deep and hard-won harmony. And finally, my unhappiness with the personification of good and evil is not an argument that I want to pursue this evening. About 15 years ago, one of my Swarthmore students confronted me in the hallway. She had, she announced, decided not to major in sociology because she couldn't see a place where sociology made a place for evil. If everything can be explained, if deep context and social theory help us to understand human cruelty and oppression, then there's no one to blame, to fight against, no group against which to be vigilant, no set of ideas to rail against, and from whom to defend ourselves. I did not say, we're a department of sociology and anthropology, and anthropology sets a place for evil at the dinner table. <laughs> <clears throat> I should have. <laughs> My colleagues in anthropology who take the study of human understanding very seriously are, I believe, as members of a discipline, more courageous about entering into the worlds of those whom they study than sociologists have been. Entering into requires both the ability to describe as if the norms and values and beliefs, experiences and circumstances were one's own. And study requires them to step away from and describe from a perch removed with the tools of insight applied to their observations. Many of the contemporary anthropologists whom I know are willing to wrestle with meaning in a way that often only theologians and theoretical physicists philosophers, and mathematicians have wrestled with meaning. But again, I've drifted. And I'm a sociologist. My student asked me, does sociology admit that there is evil? I answered, do sociologists acknowledge evil in the world? Why, yes. That wasn't her question or the answer that she wanted. Many of us would look at that question and assume that the questioner asks from the vantage point of someone with superior knowledge, there is evil, I know it, and if you don't, your loss, your ignorance, and your vulnerability. Others of us personify and objectify evil, Satan or Beelzebub, Prince of Darkness or Lucifer, actors with power who tempt us away from virtue and into transgression. 
Most secular humanists and those of us that don't even have a name for ourselves consider evil to be a combination of both structures outside of our control with psychological consequences. In other words, evil is understood as the ways in which our lives and personalities unfold in particular unjust contexts that either leave us so cut off or in pain that we're profoundly distracted from acknowledging the feelings of ourselves and others in our pursuit of our aims. Once we personify evil, there is, as I've noted earlier, a tremendous temptation to vilify people. And vilifying people is very different from holding them accountable. There are whole disciplines devoted not just to the study of, but to the argument that there are persons who are constitutionally unable to feel pain, their own or others. Such arguments and such labels like sociopath or psychopath allow us to dehumanize individuals who themselves are wired differently, have often suffered tremendously, and who behave in ways that hurt other people. But the labels exonerate us from the obligation to understand those who hurt others. And they make it easier for us to assume that some of us are incapable of experiencing pain or unable to know right from wrong. Rather, I would argue that there are persons who behave in ways that are socio or psychopathic. Their behavior would lead others to believe that they feel little empathy. When that is combined with quick processing, analytical acuity, and little or no empathy from others, it can lead to very troubling and cruel behavior indeed. But every careful and in-depth study of individuals finds psychological, social, and sometimes biological reasons for behavior. In other words, there is always context. Thorough attention to context never fails to offer us insight an explanation. I believe I've drifted again. OK, let me return to the idea that sociology acknowledges evil. Sociology is a scholarly discipline that has many assumptions and insights about social life. Among them are that collectively or in groups, human beings have a profound effect on each other about which we are often unaware. Sociology focuses on the various systems of social life, systems that are both constructed by humans and take on self-replicating attributes. These systems become so taken for granted that it is almost like they have invisibility cloaks, making it difficult, if not impossible, to imagine that life has ever existed otherwise. They include ideas and ideologies like the system of race and racism, the system of sex, gender, and sexism, patriarchy and heterosexism, and class and economic organization that normalize extreme maldistribution of wealth. These human-made and self-replicating systems exercise inordinate force and expectations in our thinking and our self-images and our decisions. The discipline of sociology attempts to reveal those ideas that are often invisible or taken for granted, that make up our everyday expectations, and thus are misunderstood by most of us as natural and inevitable. It can be very useful in offering insights about the societies in which we live, the challenges that we face as groups and individuals, and the possibilities of understanding both stasis and change. It can give us tools to observe human relationship and its absence, but it is a scholarly pursuit. Of course, like all disciplines, it is broader and more creative as persons from a variety of backgrounds bring their perspectives to bear upon it. Finally, sociology offers us new information and sometimes new knowledge, but like all scholarly pursuits, is not synonymous with wisdom. For wisdom, we need to turn to the wisdom traditions of our societies. In the spirit of the late religious scholar Houston Smith, I understand religion as a wisdom tradition. The wisdom traditions offer us metaphors and stories, but they are fundamentally about being in right relationship to each other. Of course, our wisdom traditions are birthed and come of age within particular times and places and reflect our human foibles and prejudices as well as attempts to live 
in good relationship. Too many of us, however, misunderstand the wisdom traditions as scholarship and science, rather than as stories for care and respect of each other. And we mistakenly looked to science and scholarship for wisdom. Religion and science are, as my former Swarthmore colleague, the evolutionary biologist Scott Gilbert and devout Catholic would say, complementary, members of the same family, helping us not only to understand the world around us, but to live in deep harmony with each other and it. Brueggemann, Parks, and Groom share a wonderful story in their little book entitled To Act Justly, Love Tenderly, and Walk Humbly. An old woman visits a cafe and purchases only a cup of tea. With enough money only for tea, she has a bag of her own cookies in her handbag. The cafe is crowded and while at the table for two, a man asks to share her table. He too is enjoying a cup of tea and he eats one of the cookies on the plate. She's furious at him, but says nothing, and she eats the second cookie. Fuming when he eats the third, she waits to see whether he will have the gall to eat the fourth, but he offers it to her. It is only after he departs that she opens her purse and discovers that she has never removed the cookies from her handbag. It was she who was partaking of what was his. Brueggemann says that the lady is no different from all of us. Sometimes we possess things so long that do not really belong to us that we come to think they are ours. This is a story about both distributive justice and communicative ethics. But much more than that, it is a cautionary parable for each of us to remember our perspective is always partial, and in being partial is always made better, fuller, more complete by the perspective of others. The late African-American Episcopal priest, the Reverend Dr. Peter Gomes, author of the good book, Reading the Bible with Heart and Mind, argues that one cannot combat evil, especially the evil within, on one's own. You cannot be good by yourself, he writes. One of the first defenses against evil is to acknowledge that one needs help against it. Confession is good for the soul, not only because it performs a therapeutic cleansing of the impurities that clog the spiritual bloodstream, but because to address it in confession immediately objectifies the evil and places one in a community outside of oneself. Evil's greatest ally is solitary silence, unquote. I am with Peter Gomes that one cannot combat evil alone. But that is because I am more in agreement with Martin Buber's understanding of evil as the lack of relationship. So if one is outside of relationship, then one is vulnerable to misunderstanding one's relationship to others. One needs help against evil, not, as Gomes says, because evil has a brain. One needs help against it because its opposite is genuine relationship or community. Outside of genuine relationship, we are vulnerable to seeing and treating our friends as enemies. Outside of relationship, we are vulnerable to withdrawing further into stories about our worthiness and the unworthiness of others. Outside of relationship, we do not engage each other, but talk about each other. We do not seek guidance from our wise teachers and friends, but plan moments when we can humiliate and embarrass them. We justify the moments of our own bad behavior by forgiving ourselves when forgiveness is not something that we can give ourselves. It is, by definition, definition relational. For the tools we need, we must turn to our wisdom traditions and our wise elders. From one of our Quaker elders, Eileen Flanagan, the tools include nurturing the courage to question, getting to know ourselves, seeking divine wisdom, being open to shifting our perspective, practicing loving acceptance, letting go of outcomes, and finding wisdom in community. 
In the wisdom to know the difference, Flanagan reminds us that what I consider liberation, people in community practicing wisdom together, is not necessarily an experience of comfort, joy, or righteous momentum. Even when people work together, major change, she observes, is not quick or easy. For example, many people who say that our reduction of carbon emissions must be faster and more dramatic in order to avoid catastrophic consequences feel impatient that their society is not changing enough. They are forced to accept the fact that not everyone sees things their way, even within their own communities. In fact, because we seek support and empowerment from our communities, divisions within them can be painful giving us opportunities to practice the lessons of accepting other people, forgiveness and discernment, as well as being true to ourselves. For this reason, Flanagan concludes, community can be a challenging but fruitful training ground for wisdom. Since we each experience life differently, there are multiple truths. There are also truths, experiences, and interpretations that are so routinely held up as singular and others that are so routinely dismissed as partial, uninteresting, and unimportant that part of what we need to do together is to reclaim our interpretations of the past through a more capacious embrace of the present, knowing that we will never know it all, but we have an obligation to try. For example, what if you know that your strength and expertise is not social work, but that the friend, the coworker, or neighbor in front of you needs you to be their social worker? In fact, the people with whom you usually spend time are so confounded by the fictions and fantasies they've been fed that they're starting to pay attention to the struggles and conflicts in the world. What if it's your sense that they are desperate not only for the information, but for how to be with each other, with themselves, with their friends, and with you? What if at this moment, because we are trying to wake ourselves up, it is not only our neighbors and coworkers, but our teachers and maybe our students, our parents, our spouses, our children, especially our children, asking, what do we do now, now that the police officers are killing us? Now that the president brags about assaulting women, now that people who identify as Nazis are marching in cities all over the country, now that one of our fellows solves his screaming heartache almost every week with automatic weapons in churches and schools and at music festivals, now that hurricanes and unending rains are flooding our neighborhoods and heat waves, droughts, mudslides, and fires have come to the global north the first world, the post-industrial West. It is no lie to admit that our democracy is out of shape. Too many of us have not been working together, and democracy depends on practice, depends on a workout. Too many of us have been forfeiting our rights to make decisions and competing for the material scraps that make us think we're still doing okay. If we don't practice democracy, we won't be able to use it. And if we don't practice justice, the ethical communication of seeing and acknowledging each other, there is no model for our neighbors, our politicians, our coworkers, our children. Like democracy, holding the tension of knowing that my experience is not the same as yours and our life together demands a coexistence at the least, and a reconciliation at its best, demands the development of a particular kind of intellectual, emotional, and spiritual musculature. It is time for us to get in shape. We can do that in the streets, and we can do that in our meetings. We can do that in book clubs, at scouts, at work. We can do that in our friendships and with our spouses and partners. And we can do that at town council meetings and in the voting booth. We can practice that in our volunteer work, and we can practice that at work. We can work on this in our families, and we can work on this in ourselves. 
In the family where I grew up, I was reminded regularly that unearned suffering was redemptive, that service was honorable, and that sacrifice was sanctified. I stand on the shoulders of those who suffered, sacrificed, and served, but today I choose a slightly different set of reminders. Love, liberation, and limits. This life of ours is difficult and glorious, serious and silly, loud and quiet, communal, creative, and solitary. It challenges us with its unfairness and calls us to bring our best qualities to bear in resolving injustice. It requires all that we can give it and in turn asks us to, mand to demand of it what we will. Our experience of it is inherently limited, but its limits and our own paradoxically offer us liberation to avoid gratuitous and premature depletion. In this experience of life, we each have the possibility within the walls of our skins and our skeletons, within a monastery or a relationship, within the charge of a job or, or our role in the family, on the beach of an ocean, in a boat, at its center, or the edge of a canyon, from a hospital bed, as a witness to new life at the close of this one, even within the cell of a prison, we each have the possibility to know our profound connectedness with the universe. In our desperate searching for the metaphor that captures that interconnectedness, that deep peace, that unspeakable joy, Many of the world's religions use animal or plant proxies and totems to signal and challenge those, ch excuse me, and channel those knowledges. We often use words like love and light. The idea of continuing revelation is an admission that no one document speaks all truth. For believers in a larger force beyond ourselves, it promises an ongoing justice understood as communication. For believers that the larger force is the communication and community among all things, we are assured that as we are capable of learning each day, so we are capable of hearing new truth, deep connection, good news. As we hold the tension of each of us and each other, you and me, I and thee, let's save space at the table for the unexpected. Let us be, Steve Carey once said, about shaping our lives to become better able, each of us, to help mend a world grown weary of violence and a human community brought low by too much cleverness and too little faith. So let us be about le leaning in to the relationships that we assume will make us whole, even when we have no evidence. Let us, with or without religious conviction, assume our connectedness to every other thing. Let us name ourselves and each other. Let us be vigilant against evil by whatever name we call the great disconnection by deepening ourselves in genuine community so that we have the energy and the compulsion, the courage and the curiosity to extend our hands, our hearts, an hour here, 10 minutes there, to those whom we do not know, and even and especially to those whom we fear and dislike. I do not need for you to believe what I believe, but I'll share with you my own sense that there is God in all of it.
Thank you, friends. So Jen tells me that we have a few minutes for some conversation. And I am glad to entertain comments, questions, pushback, whatever's on your heart and mind. <clears throat> I would remind friends that we are being uh, live streamed. So I will be running around with the microphone if you hold it just the way I'm holding it right below your lower lip. Folks at home as well as all the people here will be able to hear you. And do you want to call on folks as you see sure. them? Yes. In a Quaker world, I I'm slightly uncomfortable in using this, but I want to say I really appreciate what some people might say is a call to arms, uh, a call to to uh, start being active first with each other mm -hmm. and then reaching out and starting to change things because right now we really need that both internally and across the United States and the world. How about a call to linked arms? Yeah. I, was, I was thinking embracing arms. <laughs> but. Did I see a hand in the back? No. <laughs> Just testifying. <laughs> Laura. Spirit moves. <laughs> uh, you read a beautiful passage that Marcel wrote about a moment when she embodied her experience. Hmm of connection with the universe or the cosmos and what she felt was light and God. Have you had a moment in your life that was in some way similar or that when you read her story um, allows you to understand it or experience it? I've had many moments, but I will confess that for much of my life I have not liked using the term God. For a long time, I was very uncomfortable um, calling myself a Christian because for me, that was an affirmation of the doctrine rather than the story of Jesus, which I find to be an extremely powerful story, quite set apart from the mystery, um, a story of a very powerful social movement and of people who had such deep desire to keep it going that they were willing to boost up the telling of the story to make it worthwhile for other people to listen to. So um, because of my own discomfort between uh, doctrine and the story and my, uh, the length of time it took me to become comfortable with parables as truth, <laughs> right? Um, I was just very hesitant um, to use formal, uh, agreed upon language. And, um, and that's true for, for the concept of God as well. But I was assigned to write a paper, I think, in high school. And I, it led to a very deep conversation with my mom about her own theological beliefs. And um, they were so different from anything I heard in church. And um, her own thinking was so creative and so outside of the bounds um, that it gave me a tremendous amount of freedom to really think 
of um, God in, in many, many ways. So the wonderful news for me is that I have felt that kind of whole connection again and again. Um, it takes me by surprise. It'll be on a subway and a connection with a stranger. It will be in a connection at an airport. It will be in an insight um, that my son has or in a conversation with one of my in-laws. And it can be the smallest thing um, or it can be larger and more symbolic when I just feel like, wow, everything is connected. Um, and I have to kind of walk myself also back from that because as a social scientist, I'm always desperate to see things match up rationally and perfectly. And I, am, I get very worried about um, my sense that if I see connection and I see all of this wondrous um, electricity, spiritual electricity, how does that, how do I understand all the devastation and the tragedy and the cruelty of humans to each other? I mean, I get really wrapped in knots around trying to make sense of all of it as if all of it is mine to make sense of. So, um, that's a really long answer to your question. Yes, I feel like it's available to us at all times. I'm not somebody who believes there is a plan, um, and I can't believe in a plan with the kind of suffering that exists, but I do think there is something so much larger, and that that so much larger is also love and life filled. because I'm closer. <laughs> well, first, thank you very much. That was inspirational and uh, just uh, highly informative. Uh, you quoted some of my favorite authors, uh, Martin Buber, Steve Carey. Um, my question is, uh, I know a little bit of the background, but not enough. Um, how did you become a Quaker and why? Well, it turns out that I've got a whole bunch of ancestors who um, were Quakers in Philadelphia. So I'm just discovering that with the help of my husband's genealogical research. Um, they were um, Quakers from England. And um, so if there is some, I don't know, recessive gene. <laughs> um, but I'm a sociologist and I believe in nurture over nature. Um, my maternal grandfather was um, a pacifist, and it, it was very difficult for him during World War II in the town where he served as the pastor of the Baptist Church um, because the town was all in for the war. And um, certainly listening to him uh, was very important to me. Um, my uh, folks didn't want me to go to a college where they didn't know anybody. And uh, my dad had a student who was serving as the director of athletics at Haverford College, Greg Canerstein. And, um, and I ended up going to Haverford. So I certainly think repetition, right? So I went to Quaker meeting while I was at Haverford. That was four years. I found it very intriguing. Um, I never spoke, but there was something about it that really made sense to me. And certainly, again, finding myself back at Swarthmore and in this atmosphere. Um, but I, a defining moment for me was really the decision for the United States to go to war in Iraq. And then again, 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 in Afghanistan around the same time in the early 2000s. And I found myself listening to an NPR story on the news as I was driving down the highway and recognizing that for many people in the world, the United States was the evil empire, and that it was very much the way, um, I'm sure people who did not agree with the Nazis might have felt living in the Third Reich. And I just was overcome, and I was so ashamed, and so frustrated, and really feeling at loose ends. And, um, a year later, uh, my husband and I uh, became parents, 
and um, adopted our son. And it became very important to me to raise him in a religious tradition. And we looked at the local Episcopal church. And I did not feel at home there, nor was I made to feel at home there. And um, I drove by Providence Monthly Meeting, and they had the wonderful Musty sign. I think it's A.G. Musty, but uh, there is no way to peace. Peace is the way. And I thought, oh my gosh. And then I looked closer, and I saw that meeting for worship was at 11 AM. <laughs> and I said, now, that's the place for me. <laughs> but certainly, it was a combination of things. But I started going, and it really did feel like home. It's an extraordinary meeting with people from many different faith traditions and people who are also atheist and agnostic, but who are trying to live on the right path and engage each other. And uh, I felt very much at home there and joined. Signage is important. <laughs> Good signage. We'll go for another five minutes and then I'll let you go home. <laughs> um, so that's funny that you tell that story because yesterday I went to my first Quaker meeting there. It's at <laughs> actually 11.20 because I was late. <laughs> and I was late here because I was like, <laughs> could not see the signs, which is ironic because all the signs and I'm seeing people here who told me to go tonight and I didn't really know what I was walking into. <laughs> but you're really like reaffirming everything I've been like really tr struggling with because Eight, eight days ago, something very violent happened to me, and I can't say much because it's still an open investigation, but everyone keeps looking at me like I'm crazy when I say I still want to forgive him, and I want to follow. They're like, what? You're a Quaker now? It's been a week? Like, what? <laughs> and everyone just keeps, I feel like I'm speaking a different language, and you were saying that, like, this is the language, you know, that we're all, this connection that we're all feeling, and I just feel like, I'm struggling with that idea of forgiving someone who could hurt me that bad. Mm -hmm. But what you said about there are no psychopaths and that he's a human being really resonated. And I just thank you because you're giving me the courage I need to, to buck the system and want to get to know him. I don't even know his name. I knew him for three hours and two of it was awful. So I just, it's so hard to picture forgiving someone you don't even know and who would all you know is the monster and coming here just really reaffirmed that I don't want to be silenced they're telling me not to say things and I'm like I need to get this out and and do this differently because Martin Luther King I watched his daughter in the hospital for two days and all these kids going on the march and a little bit of raw vulnerability really is powerful I watched Emma Gonzalez cry for six minutes in front of thousands of people and I think it was just so empowering and it starts with conversation and when the cops are telling me that don't talk to anyone about it, you know, hide it, you know, I think that's wrong and I think people need to hear about these things so that we can change it. And so I just appreciate you having a free event that I can afford and, <laughs> and this is just a really amazing night. Thank you. Thank you for the courage to share your story. Take the time that you need. I hope you feel held in the light here tonight. I deeply appreciate what you've presented and it being so much yourself. Um, felt right. And that's where my present struggle is, is having a sense of who I am and who I want to be at my best self, at least my better self. And so when I get fiercely angry at the voice I'm hearing on the television or the message that's being delivered by that voice or those voices, uh, and I feel very much not myself, and uh, so much anger, and nowhere to turn it, to train it, to find somehow 
a way of recapturing energy from it that can fuel my better self um, is, becomes a struggle. So it's not automatic after nearly eight, eight decades of um, making the journey uh, that you arrive at your better self and that's where you, you stay, stay. And so I think you're very right to talk about the power of community and being able to be a part of community in a way that gives you some support and uh, helps you gather yourself again because I think we all are facing that these days uh, more than we'd hope to certainly after the things that we thought we'd made better um, come seemingly to tumble down. I don't really think they're gone. I don't think we've lessened who ourselves are, but the anger and <laughs> the words that go with the anger uh, uh, are not reassuring. And um, mostly I don't visit those on anybody and it's just there, me, um, Patricia sometimes <laughs> has to bear it. Uh, we do it for each other. But it's, it's a tough road and having moments like these tonight where we have a chance to reflect on that and ourselves and each other um, is, is a very powerful and good thing. Thank you, friend. You'll notice that I've put on uh, everybody's seat a little sheet. On one side is a wonderful quotation from Steve Carey. And the other side is an exercise that I'm hoping you'll take home with you. And uh, one of my colleagues gave me the book, The Gratitude Diaries. And if you're anything like me, you know, I first got it and I thought, what does she think? I'm not grateful. <laughs> I'm grateful. And the <laughs> So, I mean, arriving at our better selves is a lifelong process, right? Um, and then I thought, this is a beautiful book. <laughs> and then I thought, it's part of the neoliberal fascist regime to get me to be grateful so that I don't fight the power, right? I mean. <laughs> and then I thought, no, this is a beautiful book, right? Um, so... Uh, she has a, uh, an activity in there in which she asks people to think about their partner or their spouse, right, and appreciate things about them. But what I'm asking you to do in the activity is to think about the person you just can't stand and, and write down, it's private, right, write, it da write down something you appreciate about them, right, because we really have to turn this around and I don't believe it's going to turn around with negativity. I am so good at railing against the current people in office, but I will, I do not participate in making fun of their family. I do not participate in making fun of them physically. I do not participate in making fun of beliefs, right? Um, we need, if the positive, positivity is every drop in the bucket, right? Let's start adding some drops, drop by drop of the kindness, of the positivity. And that, that's really separate from agreeing with policies or voting people out of office. Um, it's about turning the ship. So, yeah, I mean, certainly, um, the universe is not done with me yet. Um, but uh, I think you're right, seeking out community and people who hold us to our better selves is helpful. There was a hand over here, and maybe we'll take this as the last question. <clears throat> Sorry, John, giving you your workout yeah, tonight. <laughs> uh, in any discipline, uh, the people who come to be considered as experts um, are in danger uh, of a certain kind of willful blindness. Um, because of both the educated certainty and the wishful thinking um, 
And I'm wondering, uh, in the disciplines that you are engaged in, and you've mentioned several of them tonight, um, what are the wise practices that you have seen to, that can help us to avoid being caught unawares or to recognize the truth when it, it's in front of us uh, as we um, try to live into this future that we're hoping for? Well, I think you'll notice that I would say there, were, there are three disciplines which are very influential for me. One is anthropology. It's a little bit, it, it's funny because I became a sociologist. But one is anthropology, one is psychology, um, and one is religion. And if I were going to, I was raised by a sociologist who really wanted his firstborn to be a sociologist. I talked to my cousins and you know, they're the firstborns and they each became what their father was. So I realized there's a kind of powerful family narrative here that also served a, a very particular and extraordinary purpose for an African American working class family. Um, to make sure that their kids went on and did what they knew they could do, right? Um, but if I'm honest with myself, these three other disciplines are very much where my heart is. Um, I, I guess one of the biggest ones would be psychiatry, where people are expected to go through um, psychotherapeutic psychotherapy as they're becoming trained, right? To know what it's not only deeply about oneself, but to also go through that experience. Um, but really, the very best practice, and this, this is in any, absolutely any discipline that you're in, or any profession, is to listen deeply. That's it, full stop, right? And um, if you can find yourself a community, it doesn't need to be a big community, but a community of people who will be honest with you and reflect things back to you and helping you think about your decision making. Um, I know people often say, you'll know the right decision, you'll feel it in your gut. My gut has often told me wrong, <laughs> right? So um, having very good friends that I trust actually helps me get closer to being in sync with what I know my best motives and ideals are. Um, but so I guess that's a two for, it's a, a both and. It's a listening deeply and it's a nurturing communities of trust. Um, and that, that goes a long way anyway. Um, thank you all so much for coming out tonight. I so appreciate it. <laughs>